Today's topic is a highly controversial one. We're going to be discussing, did dinosaurs have feathers? I'm Dr. Robert Carter. I'm in the studio today with my dear friend, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Well, thank you for having me on, on, on here. Thank you. You're welcome. This is going to be a lot of fun. You and I have had a lot of very long discussions on this topic. Right. We co-authored uh, an article, a major creation paper on this topic, too. We did. And yet, there's still a lot of arguing uh, between the creationists and evolutionists, even some within the creationer, creationist community, uh, on the subject of feathered dinosaurs. It is true, although I must admit some of the people in the creation community have never actually addressed what we wrote about in our paper. This is true. we addressed everything the evolutionists had. At least to our best attempt. Well, yes, of course, yes. Okay, so so right on the surface, everyone mm -hmm. needs to know. Yes. There's some controversy here. Fair enough. All right, so let's, let's deal with this controversy openly. Yep. And let's see if maybe we can unpack this and uh, help the audience understand some of the implications and what parts of this are important and what parts aren't. That's a good idea, yeah. I like to ask my audiences this. I'm going to ask you this. Mm. Does it matter if dinosaurs had feathers? Probably not in the long term, actually, because the Bible doesn't say one way or the other. So creationists are perfectly entitled to have feathered dinosaurs. It doesn't make them any less creationists if they propose this. Exactly. That's my answer, too. Okay. I, I want to know. I'm a nerd. I'm a mm. scientist. I want, I want to know the answer. But in the end, if dinosaurs have feathers or not, doesn't change anything. It certainly doesn't mean that flying birds ever evolve from dinosaurs, for instance. That's a second question. Did yeah. birds evolve from dinosaurs? Completely separate question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of fun stuff. Where do we start here? Um, looking at the ancient fossil record. Good place to go, I think, yeah. There are clearly animals with beautiful feathers. Oh, sure, yeah. And, you know, the dinosaur era rocks, we have very bird-like things with beautiful feathers. Do we have anything like that in a dinosaur? Well, that's the debatable point, isn't it? Because there's a certain uh, fossil characteristics, the bone, the skeletal characteristics of a dinosaur. One thing is a, a fancy name called perforate acetabulum. That's, okay, Ooh. acetabulum is the Latin for little vinegar cup because that's where three bones of the hip meet. And in most creatures, it's a cup shape. Okay. Where the femur, there's a process from the femur that, that articulates into that cup shape. But dinosaurs were unique in that this is actually a hole there, open or perforate. Okay, okay. Well, back way up. Ooh, yeah, okay. Okay, I understand exactly what you're saying. Right. I don't think most people listening okay. understand this. So you're saying <clears throat> that dinosaur hips are different than the hips of other animals. With that hole there instead of a cup shape thing okay. there, yes. Okay, so, so dinosaurs have what's called a perforate Acetabularium? Acetabulum. Acetabulum. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So I, I knew that. I was just. Mm -hmm. And that's. So a dinosaur is set apart from other animals based on the hip socket. That's one major that's one thing. One of the main There's also, also things in the skull, yeah, too. Yeah. Yes, holes uh, in the skull. But okay. That's one of the big differences. So when we look at these fossil bird like things, dinosaurs or not, that's the question. That is one of the questions. Yes. Okay. I guess the other thing is, what are the things claimed to be feathers? So sometimes there's no doubt they're obviously feathers. In fact, they're obviously flight feathers. Yes, other times, like Archaeopteryx, a classic one even back in the 1800s. Yeah, um, it, it had flight feathers like a pigeon has today. And, and it, by a flight feather, what we mean is it, it's a feather, and it's also asymmetric. Mm. It's wider on one side than the other. Right. And, and you can tell where, you know, if it's left or right, depending upon... The asymmetry, mm. birds don't have feathers that are symmetrical, all the feathers anyway. Right, okay. on the wing is definitely asymmetric feathers. Okay. And very highly strung, amazing structure of a barb and the, uh, the, the central shaft, the barbs coming off and barbules and hooks connecting. It's actually quite an elaborate <laughs> design in feathers. Actually, that brings up another very interesting point too. The difference between a scale and a feather. Now, what is a scale? Well, a scale is just a fold in the skin. And we can tell that because we're like when a snake, you know, peels its skin mm. off, that there's the scales right there. They, I got scales in the back of my hand here mm -hmm. if, you, if you look really carefully under a microscope. Okay. Mm -hmm. So scales are folds in the skin. What is a 
feather. Well, feather starts from a follicle. So if like anything, you think it, feathers evolve from mammalian hairs because they both start from follicles in the skin and poke out from those. It's very different from a scale. So one of the defining characteristics of a mammal is that we have these these tubes in our skin. And mm. from those tubes comes this very complicated thing called a hair, which mm. is made of protein. Yep. Now, feathers are sort of like a hyper-complex hair. Right. Because they have to be in a tube, and they when they come out, then they unfold into these unbelievably cool structures. And, and quite, quite amazing. And also, you've got some which are very decorative, like the peacock feather, which means you've got these things which have to be so coordinated that they form these patterns of circles and heart-shaped things. But it means every fiber has to have the, the dark parts in the right place to yeah. coordinate with the other one. So it's a lot of coordination to go with a feather. It's actually much more complicated than one of our hairs. Okay. So it, it's mm. really kind of funny to think that feathers evolve from scales because it's not true. I they had to yeah. evolve from something more like a hair. Yeah. And reptiles don't have hairs. Okay. And I think there are some flightless birds, but you tend the, the flightless birds tend to have more hair-like yeah. feathers because they don't need the structure for flight anymore. In fact, they could actually be harmful. So why not make it a simple thing? So you think of the feathers are actually much more hair-like. So it's a case of uh, their feathers seem to be degenerate forms of the more complex ones as opposed to evolving from something simple. There's no evidence they evolve from something simpler, but there is evidence that some could degenerate back to something like a hair. And that's one of the major problems that we see with evolution in general. Right. It is easy to devolve something, to degenerate something, to break something. Um, so if you had a beautiful feather, you get a mutation in it, and all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. Maybe that animal can't fly, but it might still be able to run. And also might be a good insulation device because you it think of the, the, down, the, the downy the pillars you have. The, those feathers are actually very loose. They're not yeah. joined together like the proper feathers are. Yeah. But to go in the other direction. That's the hard part. To go from nothing to a feather. I mean, you're talking about an incredibly highly engineered system that has to be pre-planned. Its function has to be known from the beginning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So we have issues with the evolutionary story of the evolution of feathers and the evolution of birds. Because birds also, I mean, one of my favorite topics is the way birds breathe. Okay. And we have a diaphragm. We have a, a muscle here that when it pulls down, it, it inflates right. our lungs. Okay. Well, reptiles don't do that. Hmm. They move their liver. It's called a hepatic pump. Their Whoa. liver moves up and down, and that pushes air in and out of their lungs. That's weird. It's yeah. weird, but that's how they do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, birds don't do either of those. A bird lung is a one-way system. There's a hole in the bottom of their lung. So their air goes through the lung all the way through. There's no dead space. That's efficient, sounds like. Uh, super efficient. We, the reason that we can't fly, one of the big reasons is we will never be able to pull enough oxygen out of the air. Because mm. most of our lung is dead space. The okay. oxygen has to diffuse down. The CO2 has to diffuse out. Mm-hmm. The bird has no dead space. The air goes all the way through, comes out the bottom side, comes around. So they might be breathing in and out their nares in their beak, but their lungs are radically different. And so the evolution of the bird lung is a massive problem because what's the first step? You're going to poke a hole in the bottom of the lung? So it's basically a hernia uh, of a yeah. sort, isn't it? And that a creature with one of those is dead. Is dead? Yeah. I mean, because natural selection can't know that in millions of years from from now, it's going to become a nice functioning bird lung. It only functions with what it has now. So the origin of the bird lung is sounds pretty huge, right? Yeah. So bird lungs, bird feathers. Yep. All all these giant evolutionary steps are majorly problematic. Right. Let me ask you a curveball question, though. Oh, okay. That's not on our list. It's not on our outline here. It's totally curveball. I mean, if we were to classify birds, what are they most similar to? Ooh, I mean, that's an interesting question because they're not really similar to anything. There's no other animal that we know that has feathers, so mm-hmm. they're unique there. And they're warm-blooded. They're, they're warm-blooded, so they're like mammals in warm-bloodedness. They have a structure that comes from a follicle like a mammal, but they lay eggs like a reptile does. And they lay hard eggs, though. Like a reptile, I suppose. Mm, reptiles are soft eggs. Oh, do they? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Leather and eggs. And also, don't uh, birds, they excrete uric acid. Yes. Ra- rather than urea like mammals do. Yes. Okay, mm. but let me ask you, mm. let me turn around the other direction here. Okay. What are humans most similar to? Are we animals or plants? 
or different animals. Within animals, are we mammals? Yeah. Or, okay, we're mammals. Because we have um, live, oh, live young, um, we have breastfeeding, well, the females of our type do anyway. Yeah, yeah and we're warm-blooded okay. and we yep. produce hair. Mm -hmm. Okay, amongst the mammals, are we more similar to monkeys or squirrels? Definitely monkeys, right? Okay, yes. and amongst the monkeys, are we more similar to apes or lemurs? Definitely the ape types. Okay, so we have no problem classifying humans right, right next to the apes. Right, yeah, I think that's true from similarities. From and, similarities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have no problem personally classifying birds right next to reptiles. Even, that's fair. Even as a subset of reptiles. If the taxonomists want to say that birds cluster underneath alligators, underneath turtles, and within a certain group of, 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 of dinosaurs even. Okay. I have no problem necessarily with that. That's just the way they cluster using, right. using morphometry and, and, and statistics. And they talk about archosaurs now as a big overarching group, including the dinosaurs yeah. and birds being part of the celiosaur type dinosaurs by just clustering similarities. Yes. What I have a problem with is when they talk about the non-avian dinosaurs. That's going way too far. Like we wouldn't call us um, hairless apes. Well, some people would, actually. Yeah, some people would, and yeah. we disagree with them very strongly. Right. So it's not a question of um, who's more similar to whom. Mm -hmm. It's a question of is evolution possible. Right. And no, evolution's not possible. Mathematically, physiologically, physically, it's not going to happen. But still, birds do have some things. If you look at a bird foot, I mean, it's very similar to a reptile foot in some ways, at least a dinosaur foot in some ways. I don't care where they classify them. In some ways, they're different because you've got the arch archaeopter with a very clear perching foot, which is designed for a branch perching. Yes. Because you've got the various way the claws are designed, which I think a T-Rex or a um, Velociraptor wouldn't have that sort of perching foot. That's right. So but the, so the variations on a foot theme, mm -hmm. but it's a scaly foot with claws. Yeah, that's true. All right. So we can put that aside also. Mm -hmm. Then the next question is, what do we do with all these feathered things in the fossil record? Going back to earlier, we didn't answer the question. Mm. Did dinosaurs have feathers? Well, I actually dispute there's anything with proven dinosaur features like the perforate acetabulum that has undoubted feathers. I agree. As opposed to, say, um, a crest like Sinoceropteryx seems to have, when you look at the fossil, these the fibers they've found seem to be connected to something. So it's a single structure with like a crest, which and they were found near lakes. So I have to wonder if there's a crest of some sort of thing to help with swimming Possibly. in water. Um, it doesn't look like they're fibers supporting individual things like feathers. It's, it's clearly they combine into a crest there. So that's one thing with um, the so fossils. So we do find some... Dinosaurs with fuzzy like things. Yes. At least along their back and along their tail. Right. Okay. And they could or could not be feathers, but they're not screaming, this is a feather. No. Like some of the obvious feathers that we find in the fossil record. Yeah, the Archaeopteryx is very obvious feathers. And the other thing is, when you look at Archaeopteryx and even something like Confucius Ornus, which is a feathered bird, flying bird with a beak, um, when you use the evolutionary dating methods, they predate the usual feathered dinosaur candidates by um, tens of millions of years often. So it's a case of uh, how does a grandfather be younger than the grandson? It's a very interesting conundrum that... We don't have many bird fossils because birds don't preserve very well. But Hollow we, bones, probably. Yeah. Maybe to that, yeah. But we are finding more of them over time. Right. And the dates that they ascribe to them <coughs> have pushed birds back pretty close to the point where they, the group that supposedly evolved into birds evolved itself. And so I like to say, so if birds evolved from dinosaurs, when? You might have run out of time. Well, especially when you haven't got the usual candidates uh, in the fossil record to evolve them from. Yeah. So All the right. timing issue is actually quite an interesting problem that people like uh, evolutionary paleontologists like Alan Fiducci have pointed out this problem that the, the dates are not right, even using their dating systems. So there's no clear evolutionary progression from dinosaurs to birds. Well, the other thing is when you look at the way birds uh, – 
run. In fact, they're there. What you think is their knee joint is actually corresponds to our ankle joint because their thigh bone is actually inside their body. It's actually fused to their body. Mm. It's part of their, their avian lung system that you talked yeah. about, right? So, I mean, that's another thing. When you look at the T Rex, the thigh comes out of the body. When you look at any bird, the thigh is inside. So, how do you go from one thing to the other? Because it wouldn't be very good for running if you if your thigh got stuck inside your body. No, it wouldn't. Because <laughs> surely you're trying to evolve a fast running thing you'd have to fly outside the body for leverage you want to have very th very heavy hindquarters for the muscles there but for a bird you want to reduce your hindquarters so you got less weight to take off if you think about it, all the muscular of a bird is in its arms what to do to, to, for the yeah, flight you massive flight muscles but that's uh, why we eat chicken breast meat even and, and yeah. uh, other that's because of their and it's yummy it is but we don't see any dinosaurs that are front heavy we well, look at T Rex with its very tiny looking yeah, arms. Okay, tiny, they could the curl four hundred pounds, but compared to the size of their body. But then you look at any bird with a powerful wing. The weight distribution is totally wrong to go from one thing to the other. Yeah. So but even the select the selection would actually favour the fast running and not the top heavy thing. Yeah, because the top heavy thing would have a great disadvantage before it actually learned how to fly. Just look at um, look at something like a uh, an ostrich or an emu. Mm. They got big old back legs, very strong back legs, and his tiny little wings mm. because they need to run. Right, and they run, they can. And they're never going to re-evolve the ability to fly if they ever lost the ability to fly in the first place. But they mm. never re-evolve the ability to fly because they can't. That transition means they get eaten. And how would they get their, their fine feathers back, which after, after degeneration? So a lot of things, yeah, it's not going to go in reverse. There's something else that really bothers me in the feathered dinosaur category. Okay. And that is most of the fossils are coming from one particular place, a quarry in China. Oh, my goodness. And one particular scientist has his name on essentially every one of the papers. Uh, Xu Xing, I think it might be. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. You did a much better job than me. But that is a, um, a caution for me. In, we've had a lot of scientific um, examples over the last couple of decades of you know one person who's cornered a particular field mm. only to be brought down because of incorrect reporting and things like that. I mean, there are certainly dubious fossils from that area because yeah. one of the most infamous was called Archaeoraptor. Yeah, National, National Geographic oh. put on the front page. Oh, and nature loved it, but then it turned out it was a complete piltdown bird type thing, yeah. combining two different um, fossils. And the, the way they figured that out is some paleontologists went back to this quarry hmm. and they said, let's look for what's called the counter slab. They only had one half the fossil. Let's look right. for the other half, mm. the, the split part. And when they found it, which they did, they realized it didn't match up. So someone had taken a dinosaur and a bird and a couple other things and glued them together and wow. sold it to National Geographic for a couple of million dollars. And it wasn't true. And you find, I think, Stores Olson, who is a curator of birds at the Smithsonian, so a real, a real bird expert, really excoriated National Geographic and nature for being so tied up with this dinosaur origin of birds that they were willing to, to believe a forgery without proper justification. That's right. Now, the same uh, team, the same Chinese group, uh, published a supposed dinosaur tale with feathers on it mm. in amber right. a couple of years ago. And that, again, you know, this one guy's got his name on his mm -hmm. paper again. And, and but something came up also that, that's a problem in that they didn't find it. They bought it. So there's uh, actually a lack of provenance. Lack of provenance. And that a lot of these uh, feathered dinosaur fossils is, you know, villagers in China are going out because they realize if they find a world-class fossil, they can make some cash. Mm. And they're doing all the digging, and, and they'll bring it to the scientists and say, hey, look what I found. And they've lost the content. What layer was it found in? So was it found in the right layer? Well, we don't really know because they've actually yeah. didn't see it themselves. And so this um, this dinosaur supposed tail feather, mm. um, there's a couple of bones there, and it's in a piece of amber. thing is, you can melt amber. Mm. You can stick stuff in it. Now, it tends to turn a brown. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of wondering if you put it under, you know, exactly right at that melting point using some some high tech piece of gear. Maybe that keep can oxygen maintain away big, from it or something. I'm not sure if it's an keep, oxidation yeah, can problem. Keep oxygen away from it and then put something in it and let it cool. Hmm. Well, they're clearly they're feathers in this piece of amber. Yeah. But it's not clear if that's a dinosaur tail mm. 
or the end of a bird tail. Because you wonder, I mean, how did the um, amber manage to catch the tail? But what about the rest of the dinosaur? Did it uh, lose its tail like a lizard did? Or what, what happened? I mean, where's the rest of it? Don't know. Don't know. But there's there are big questions. And, and even amongst the creationists, they argue, oh, no, that really is this or really is that. But mm. my, I just take 10,000 foot view and I look at this and I say, I got questions about its provenance. Yeah. I got questions about um, whether or not it's a dinosaur or a bird. Mm. But there's definitely feathers in the amber. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, I think it's a bird feather. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, even something like T-Rex, we have skin fossils of T-Rex. We got skin fossils of a lot of dinosaurs. Mm. If you're going to have a feather, there's going to be a hole there because you got to perforate the skin to get a feather come That's out. That's true. Yeah. And T-Rex, multiple places on its body, no evidence of feathers. In fact, it's quite distinct to some of the, the – they've got sort of bumps on their skin, but no places for feathers to grow from. That's right. So I personally don't care – if dinosaurs have feathers or not. That's a fair thing to say, actually, yeah. But scientifically, I want to know. And scientifically, I am yet to be convinced. And that's exactly. The phrase I like to use is, the evidence is not convincing. There but, is some evidence, and we can't just say there's zero. Right. But when I look at it, I'm like, eh, you got nothing better than that? Mm. Clearly, the bird fossils have feathers, and they're beautiful. Yep. But dinosaurs, I, I'm... I am yet to be convinced. Right. I mean, but it wouldn't overturn our general biblical worldview if something like that was found. No. Wouldn't change anything at all, because the Bible doesn't say dinosaurs did not have feathers. In fact, the Bible seems to have very much more functional groupings of animals, like they have a term off, meaning bird, bat, yeah. probably pterodactyl, yeah, anything that fly. fly. So they just grouped it official. I think you as a marine, marine biologist know about things like the, the necton that swim and the benthos that dwell on the bottom, yeah, all that the, sort of stuff. And the plankton. You're actually the one who pointed it out. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Goodness. I mean, I, I knew that, but as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, that's true. We use functional classifications. The things that stick to the bottom are the benthos. The thing that swim are the necton. Hmm. We do, and it doesn't matter what it is. You talk about plankton. Well, that could be a, a crab larvae. It could be a single-celled animal. It could be a, a little jellyfish. Could Those be, are yeah. you know, radically different things, and we just call them a plankton. Oh, that's, that's pretty dismissive. And the Bible uses the same sort of functional classification as modern top marine biologists do, it sounds like. Yeah. So, how were we classify dinosaurs? It's not super important. Mm, it's but true. it's fun. Yeah. And we want to you know, back away from, from yelling and screaming at each other. Sure, yes. But we also want to acknowledge that um, the data do not demand that dinosaurs had feathers. I would have to agree with that, yep. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot more resources on this topic on creation.com. You can find uh, the article that Jonathan and I wrote on creation.com, and it'll be in the show notes also. We have an entire dinosaur section, dinosaur Q&A. Because we've been writing about dinosaurs, not just me, I mean CMI in general, for a long time. Because this is a subject that Christians struggle with, they want to know about, mm. and uh, we've provided the answers for you. So go ahead and dig in, and you can learn on your own from here on out, but we hope we encourage you a little bit on a very difficult and very controversial subject.